Okay, so a warm welcome to this evening's public lecture. I'm very thrilled and honored to have been invited to present and moderate the talk of Professor de Greve. So welcome everybody here in the room and everybody online on Zoom. Um, it's, yeah, it's today's last lecture of a long and thrilling summer school, as I heard. And um, yeah, Peter de Greve is a very particular host. He's not only a philosopher, he's also a writer, and also he dealt a lot uh, with aesthetics in his, uh, during his academic and intellectual parkour. I will only say a few words about him. He's currently a professor at University of Leuven. And sorry, I printed so much material on you that I now got lost. Um, yeah, it's here. And you are a professor of, uh, professor of philosophy and aesthetics uh, at the Luca School of Arts, a school that you founded yourself in uh, 2008, if I'm correct. Yeah, together with a lot of other people. Yeah, together. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, and before you were a professor of metaphysics and aesthetics at the University of Antwerp. And um, yeah, you cover a range of different fields and traditions, mainly from the 19th, uh, 20th century to contemporary philosophy, uh, including as uh, current phenomenology, critical theory, philosophy of science, hermeneutics, and aesthetics. And we could situate you as um, ranging between French post-structuralist philosophy and what we might term continental German philosophy. So you have been publishing on uh, authors like Gilles Deleuze, Jean-Luc Nancy, but also on Martin Heidegger and Friedrich Nietzsche. And I think we will see that also in uh, this evening's lecture. And I will just mention two of your many publications, and I will uh, name the English translation because I'm unable to pronounce it in Dutch. So there was one uh, essay with which you gained uh, particular attention. It was on Friedrich Nietzsche, and the English title is Chaos and Decline from 2003. And you published a monograph recently, I mean, recently in 2012 on Gilles Deleuze and with the interesting combination Gilles Deleuze and materialism. So we are very uh, intrigued and looking forward to your talk, which you announced to be on, on being silenced, echoes of the ineffable. So thank you very much for being here, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for your kind introduction, and um, uh, many thanks to the amazing uh, committee of organizers for uh, inviting me and for um, uh, creating this event. This, this event it has been, although I missed a part, it, it has been quite extraordinary, I, I guess, to be continued. I Recording say. in progress. Yeah. Um, my argument will uh, be uh, on, let's say, European modernist and postmodernist philosophy. More specifically, uh, Heidegger, Vatimo, uh, Nancy. But uh, I speak from a silent position too, and uh, that has a name. She's called Sarah Kaufmann. Um, she has uh, been my teacher in Paris, and uh, I've considered uh, myself to be her pupil all of my uh, professional life, so to speak. Today, uh, more than ever, Silence signifies the active, fragile retreat from an intractable world. Humans have always had habits of retreating in certain places, secular and sacred. Today, however, our hiding places have mostly become internalized. In order to remain untouched by a world where so many aggressively strive for visibility and audience everywhere at any time, we have no choice but to hide in often elusive forms of silence. Thus, our silences have become the loopholes of human hyperactivity. They are as fractured as they are becoming essential. Past retreats, uh, historical retreats, as I may call them, if I may call them that, were signaled by Shakespeare's famous evocation of human life at the end of his Macbeth. Uh, the tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, uh, signifying nothing. 
his humans, huh, historical humans, could still retreat from the meaninglessness of all the rattle into some vita contemplativa. Today, however, those places have vanished. The fury is omnipresent, all-pervading. Silence itself has now become the plane of idiocy, signifying nothing. Our retreats into silence are scattered in the world by this world. We now live in what we could call, paraphrasing Adorno, minima silencia. It's bad Latin, but let's put aside. Our inner silences may grow, but as deserts, in the Nietzschean sense, wüste. Even when we're in it, we never are, not anymore. On the outlook for some silence here today with you, we will meet Wittgenstein, Heisinger, Heidegger, Plato, Derrida, Rousseau, Spinoza, Nancy, Vatimo. All of them, except for the last one, Vatimo, silenced voices, but whose echoes still resonate in us and hopefully with us. State of play, um, the days of big silence are behind us. Uh, big silence existed in three forms, approximately mythical silence, uh, known among so many other stories from Ulysses' shipmates' dumbness as they witnessed their commander undergo the silence acoustic violence, uh, maybe the world's first rock concert, or uh, Penelope's rebellious taciturnity back home in Ithaca, withstanding in faith the advances of Ulysses' rivals. Uh, Ten years, more or less, of silence for the wandering Ulysses, uh, 24 Penelope, that's big. Uh, silence back then was solitude's sister, as in Marquez' 100 years of solitude. Two, uh, the long history of holy silence, several thousands of years of ascetic solitude from the ancient hermits, Hindus or Christians alike, to the late medieval monks with their oddly heroic rejection of human contact, their refusal to speak, or their ability to avoid speech. Three, uh, our main concern here, metaphysical silence, uh, from pre-Socratic thought through Plato to Blaise Pascal's famous terror, uh, anguished as he became at the dawn of our Newtonian age by, quote, the eternal silence of those infinite spaces, uh, the biggest silence of them all. The mythical, the holy, uh, the metaphysical, all retreated from the human experience and the cultural organization of silence. Silence is now after thought, after glow. I believe it was early modernist philosophy that first noticed and discussed, conceptualized the irrevocable loss of big silence. Depicting this discussion will constitute my first movement. Wittgenstein's famous statement, again, the one sentence final chapter of his Tractatus, uh, we all know by heart, wovon man nicht sprechen kann, darüber muss man schweigen. The expression could be considered borderline tolerance, uh, as if Wittgenstein was intended on silencing dummies. Shut up if you don't know what you're talking about. Uh, dummy up. Surprisingly, uh, the predicates dumb, dumm, Dom in Dutch, stupid, owe their meaning to silence, uh, to speechlessness, as do stumm in German or stumm in Dutch. Uh, stupid itself is a silent, open mouth, uh, and being stupid fundamentally means being silenced, hit by stupidity. Uh, Wittgenstein, too, hits us with that last sentence, man muss schweigen, uh, not even sollen, uh, müssen, no choice, no liberty, but of course, uh, he uses the personal pronoun man, von man nicht sprechen kann, wir müssen man schweigen, actually addressing, according to me, uh, his own impersonalized self. His writing there is the tras, uh, Derrida would say, uh, or the visualized echo, uh, the surfacing echo, as I prefer, of the silent dialogue Wittgenstein is having with himself, uh, with or in his soul, uh, following the well-known platonic image of thought in Theaetetus and other texts and the talk which the soul has with itself, as uh, the image of thinking. Instead of being an expression of intolerance or authoritarianism, uh, silencing, the conclusion of the Tractatus is more likely to be the sign of a true philosophical reflection, 
uh, riddled with doubt. Uh, one can almost see Wittgenstein thinking at the end, just before writing down this one sentence, final chapter seven, uh, I've said all these extraordinary things, but maybe I just should have shut my mouth. Uh, Mann, uh, one Mann nicht sprechen kann, is Wittgenstein. First of all, uh, ein Mann ohne Wörter, or almost, uh, he said them anyhow, uh, all those words, those things, uh, before intending silence or thinking about intending silence. That's very philosophical too. Uh, first speak, then desire silence. The man owns selbst, uh, without self uh, too, uh, um, using that third person, man, uh, Wittgenstein somehow, somehow impersonalizes himself uh, in this retroactively desired retreat into silence. His explicit, expressed inclination to taciturnity is, according to me, huh, a de-defining gesture. Uh, this silent impersonalization yeah, in, in man, uh, this quietly not being a self, ultimately, this not being defined and not being able or willing to be defined constitutes, as I have come to believe through the years, something highly philosophical. Uh, philosophy, philosophy as a definition of not-selves and philosophers themselves as defining not-selves. And to be clear, no depersonalization uh, uh, that would be bullying, uh, forcing people into involuntary silence, uh, uh, no ad libitum, but impersonalization, uh, desiring silence as a retreat away from the individual, away from das Ich, uh, into something general, das Mann, das Es, maybe. Uh, we'll come back to this. This kind of topic... Uh, or this trope, uh, this philosophical imagery rebounds, and uh, that same old Platonic echo resurfaces a few le years later, albeit on a much vaster and an even more polemic scale in Heidegger's Sein und Zeit. Uh, famous, as you know, uh, is uh, paragraph 35 of that iconic work on Das Gerede, uh, idle talk in Macquarie and Robinson's translation, uh, the blah, 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 everyday practice of Das Mann, uh, as Heidegger calls it, the they, the anonymous we, the mob, the multitude, the public, we should say today, the web. Uh, um, not the same Mann, uh, not the same impersonality, or so it seems. Uh, uh, humans, in any case, just talk and talk, Idly, bodenlosig, Heidegger says, uh, it's all noise. It's all noise. Humans are noisy creatures. It might well be a modernist definition of humanity, animal tumultuosus, and man is the noisy animal, das Lärmtier, uh, about uh, the only mammal that immediately starts screaming upon birth. This idle talk, uh, human noisiness, and uh, so the very existence of the Heideggerian Mann uh, is a modern form of decay, uh, verfall, uh, a decline of what Heidegger calls authenticity. Uh, let's stick to this for one moment. And the idea itself of the modern age as a time of revelation of the human essence of noisiness uh, wasn't new. Uh, uh, Heisinger, before Heidegger in his Waning of the Middle Ages, claims, and I quote, uh, the modern town hardly knows silence or darkness in their purity, uh, nor the effect of a solitary light or a single distant cry. People, he continues, and he writes, men, the same man, <laughs> the same rhetoric, weren't blunted by sounds, by noise. Uh, he used the, the Dutch word for stomped, as close semantically to verstummt. Yes, the same silence. Yeah. We modern humans are noisy and at the same time silenced by that noise. In Sein und Zeit, especially that paragraph 35, the notion of das Mann is even more crucial than Wittgenstein's uh, Mann or Heisinger's Mann. Uh, Heidegger's Mann, the mob, uh, that existential form of massive decay, so to speak, uh, con constitutes the appearance of inauthenticity, of lack of personality, of meaninglessness, uh, everything we often summarize by the concept of noise. Here, the impersonal is actually depersonalizing, uh, non-philosophical. Uh, it's a dump, 
under which the truly philosophical is hidden. Uh, modern noise is the decline of the philosophical self-reflective silence we encountered in Wittgenstein and much before him in Plato. Uh, it signals and signifies what I have called the loss of big silence uh, or the big loss of ancient silence. In the preceding paragraph, 34, uh, you're not liberated yet. Uh, Dasein und Rede, um, die Sprache, existence and speech, uh, language. Heidegger denotes, and I quote, being silent, uh, schweigen, uh, as a condition of true speech. Uh, another quotation. Um, Keeping silent authentically is possible only in genuine discoursing, speech, rede. To be able to keep silent, uh, Dasein must, again, muss, uh, have something to say, that is, have at its disposal an authentic and rich openness of itself. End of quote. We're so very close here uh, to both Wittgenstein's desired silence and Plato's conversation of the soul with itself. Uh, Heidegger opposes, thus Schweigen, uh, to what he calls speaking at length, as a translation, uh, talking a lot, uh, das Vielsprechen, uh, the idle talk of paragraph 35, which is, he says, white laufig, uh, long winded and tedious. Vielsprecherei uh, uh, results in, that's a quote, fake clarity, shine klarheit. That's our fake news, of course. In, other quote, the unintelligibility of the trivial, unverständlichkeit der Trivialität. Now consider this, and come to my point, I feel like a professor lecturing here, but between these paragraphs 34 and 35, and at least paragraph 65, and temporality as the ontological meaning of caring, more than 150 pages, Heidegger consistently hammers home the fact that true clarity, non-trivial understanding can be found only in the silence of conscience, gewissen. The inner voice, the quiet inner voice, a, and I quote, unique and persistent mode of silence, das eternity, das schweigen, it's his claim. Silent, yes, but don't forget, especially in acute danger and continually, and continue, uh, in um, acute danger of being silenced by the endless blah, 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 uh, the idle talk of the modern public voice. Silencing the silence, you see, that's an interesting paradox. And it's how early modernism mourns, so to speak, in my view, uh, the loss of big silence. Only the quiet inner voice, quote, can call us back uh, from the idle talk into the secrecy, uh, verschwiegenheit, of the existing potentiality of being. <laughs> That's the calling, uh, roof character of Dasein's conscience, a uh, calling of silence, or rather, the crying out of silenced silence, uh, that, that paradox again, uh, the echo of a decayed, authentic voice. Now you remember this line, I've just quoted it, uh, to be able to keep silent, Dasein must have something to say. Hmm? 130 pages deeper into the text, another quote, whoever wants to give us to understand something silently, schweigen zu vergeben, zu verstehen geben will, must have something to say. End of quote. And this is a passage in paragraph 60, uh, page 296 for the fanatics in the public. On Gewissen, conscious and Gewissen's Rede. And then the final quote, um, paragraph 64, page 300. Um, 23, that's more than 150 pages later, as something that keeps silent, authentic being oneself is just a sort of thing that does not keep on saying I, I, uh, but in its secrecy is that throne entity as which I can authentically be. Let it resonate. But there again, that last sentence, the impersonalizing energy of the philosopher is at work, and not only against, against the man, man uh, the mob, the masses, the web, uh, that's paragraph 34, but also against the ich, ich. Uh, that's the impersonalizing move, not depersonalizing. Now here's my point. Throughout Sein und Zeit, 
the slow, laborious, amazing discovery of being and of the meaning of being, uh, namely of the authentic, so-called ecstatic forms of time in the consciousness of, of, of man, uh, past, present, future. They all pass through this mournful silence. Being in Heidegger's sense is simply inconceivable without it. That's the essence, das Wesen, of silence. It might well be the essence of Sein und Zeit, the whole book. Following the reasoning of fundamental ontology, as Heidegger calls, this, calls it in this text, being is the being of silence. The answer to the question of the meaning of being in general depends on it uh, and the solution to the problem of uh, Dasein's original and structural uh, totality with it. it. It all depends on it. Ontological insight and overview, existential authenticity and originality, human genuineness, true care, uh, that's a lot, uh, key values of this early existentialism, they're all simply inconceivable without the founding and edifying event of silence. Uh, silence is the being, with a little a, of being with a capital A. Uh, true being is in fact the echo of silence. And I'll need to, to explain that further in my second movement. But first, to conclude this one, uh, just one more thought. Man, I said, it's a noisy animal, a salam tier, that was incomplete. Building on Heidegger's distinction between authentic and inauthentic speech, and whatever it's worth, uh, Rede Gerede, and his early modernist existentialist uh, view of, on human life, uh, on the fuss, the Machenschaft, das Gestell later on, uh, you name it. I would like to sharpen that definition. European early modernism, uh, first half of the 20th century, is of course the period of the, f period of the final realization of the death of God. Uh, the great 19th century German theme, Hegel, Feuerbach, Wagner, Nietzsche, uh, in my sublime symphony, were it not for the colossal and abyssal laws of harmony that runs through it. Just this one fragment, uh, chosen from Nietzsche, uh, and his illustrious fable, uh, Der Tolle Mensch, widely known, uh, where the coming chaos of the modern age is announced as, quote, the racket of God's grave diggers. Do we like philosophy? <laughs> the public, and das Mann, upon hearing these words, uh, Nietzsche writes, fell quiet, stood stupid, uh, dumm, stumm. Uh, he schwieg der tolle Mensch, uh, uh, tolle Mensch, uh, the madman went silent, and auch sie schwiegen, they too, their fellow silence, uh, and blicked und blickten befriended auf ihn. Uh, they looked in a strange way, alien, alienated upon this strange figure. Uh, you, you, you sense the gravity of silence in, in that sentence. Modernity's horror vacui, if I may call it that, is above all the horror silenci. Uh, the horror created by that silence and in front of it. It's God's silence, as Igmar Bergman says, or maybe humanity's belated consciousness of that kind of disturbing silence, and it's befriended Schweigen. This surprising, alienating dumbness shows us the way to the really meaningful definition of ourselves, and contemporary humans, heirs to the loss of big silence, and discoverers, pioneers of the heavenly silence. It's, a, it's double, uh, what I'm about to say, but not ambiguous, I think. Closing in uh, on these late modern, early modernist notions, I would like to introduce at this point the Latin meaning of fas, F-A-S, uh, presumably etymologically close to the Greek concept of themis, uh, the divine law as revealed through oracle. Uh, the Latin fas is derived from the verb fari, to speak. Uh, fatus sum, first person, fatum est, you know, the fatum resonating there. Fas is divine speech, divine message, often only uh, audible in the inner silence of the human soul. Remember Socrates, he was not a Roman, of course, but uh, remember so Socrates' uh, daimonion. That's the silence uh, faintly echoing in Heidegger's being. Fas is the godly command. Literally, you could say with... Nietzsche, Wagner, maybe Heidegger, I don't know. Das Gerede der Götter, uh, the idle talk of the gods, uh, Götter, Geschwätz. Since Feuerbach and Nietzsche, uh, since 
God's demise, consequently, since divine taciturnity, taket deus in excelsis, we humans live in an age of nefas, meaning both, in Latin, godlessness and speechlessness. As I said, it's double, but not ambiguous. Both godless speech, sacrilege, and speechless gods. We have, in fact, become the animal nefastus, fatally free, Sartre said, condamné à être libre, echoing, uh, Sartre then echoing not only Heidegger's Geworfenheit, as you know, in Seinem Zeit, the very core of uh, human freedom, but I think also Rousseau's ideal of forceful freedom in the social contract. Uh, on le forcera, uh, l'homme moderne, on le forcera d'être libre. We will force him to be free. Uh, man muss ihn, der moderne Mensch, zwingen, frei zu sein. Uh, in, on is man, again. Uh, this is, Rousseau says, it's in the text, the tacit, uh, the silent condition of the general will in modern society, being democracy. The tacit. We have to be free, uh, we have to have absolute speech, absolute free speech, uh, but fundamentally, tacitly, silently, which means fatally, and uh, the façon fast, without ever knowing where it all comes from. Uh, that's what our analysis of Heidegger pointed out. Uh, silence in both senses, the big silence of the past, mythical, holy, metaphysical, and its silent or silenced echoes at present make us modern humans into this dangerously fateful animal uh, struck by the horror silenci uh, nefastus. Second movement. I'll speed up. Let's presume for a moment uh, that I have established the hermeneutical fact that the ruins of big silence, uh, these echoes of ancient, holy, mythical, metaphysical times, form the hidden bedrock of Heidegger's being. And that we are still stuck with it uh, and in it. I believe, uh, it comes my argument, that we urgently need not so much to come to terms with it, uh, with our status nefastus, uh, our fatal modern human condition. We've been doing nothing else for generations now. Hmm? We, my statement is, we urgently need to silence being. You see, silence being, not once and for all. Uh, I don't share the radicalism of the modern and modernist thinkers uh, to heavenly influenced, I guess, as I am, by the more weaker modes of postmodern thought. After all, being is, as Parmenides said, although I realize it is not, as Heraclitus said. So many of my own teacher philosophers, Kaufmann Derrida, Vatimo, Lacula Bart, Nancy up to a certain point, led the frontal attack against the bulk of Western metaphysical tradition called ontotheology, by Heidegger, or the metaphysics of presence by Derrida, uh, a core value of some metaphysics of being. The criticism was directed, as you know, against the idea of being as a totality, and Ganzheit is Sein, and I won't go into that. And we were summoned to leave behind, once and for all, uh, the history of Western spiritual totalitarianism. From Plato's Parousia to Aristotle's Akineton Usia, the Supreme Being, through Christian Catholic theology right up to the contemporary globalism with its dystopian biotechnological capitalist surveillance culture. <laughs> it's a lot. Instead, huh, we were told we should start experiencing being as a verb, uh, it's, uh, as an event. That's Ereignis in Heidegger, L'Evénement in Deleuze, or even Le Devenir in Deleuze. That's Destinerance in Derrida, that's some stray fate. It's being diffracted in Nancy. Yeah. That, that's the push I, I remember from my education in postmodernism. Remarkably, the criticism of the metaphysics of being stayed well within the boundaries of the thinking of being. Yeah, that's the downside of my statement. A sign that's thinking, we're still in it. It's like the addict, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. Uh, even in moving away from being as a thing, uh, the thing itself, we were in once. Uh, we remain obsessed by it, verbally, uh, which mean, literally means we can't remain silent about it. Even while desiring to destroy or deconstruct its metaphysics, we just kept on talking about being on being's terms. 
two examples uh, in the second movement to illust illustrate that point. Gianni Vatimo uh, can be considered a follower of Heidegger and his weak thought, Il pensiero debole, primarily, primarily denotes what Lyotard had, Lyotard had called the uh, postmodern condition and the uh, uh, disappearance of the great master narratives in the course of the 20th century. Uh, decomposition des grands récits, uh, decomposition, patrifying, uh, is a clear and Nietzschean concept in Lyotard. Uh, Vatimo himself prefers for the same thing, uh, prefers the Heideggerian concept of Verwindung, uh, torsion, distortion, di digestion, uh, the slow, somehow natural, material, unraveling, weakening of all strong metaphysical structures of the past. Recognizable for Vatimo, uh, it is in the crumbling authority of the church and of Christianity as such. And you remember his book, his marvelous book, I, f I think, I believe, I believe. I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. That's Vatimo as I know him. Uh, in the unstoppable diver diversification of social, cultural, and political life, uh, away from any binary model, we say today, or in the vaporization of the real. Uh, it's another expression by Vatimo. Weak thought is the philosophical reflection uh, of, uh, in the sense of a mirror, uh, and reflection on, in the sense of thought, uh, the weakening of Seinsgeschichte, that's, I think, the core idea in, in Vatimo. To put it simply, uh, the super real strong structure of the past gives way to numerous fuzzy structures now, uh, quite recognizable in this, our time. Uh, that weakening, however, is a weakening of being, uh, in a subjective as well as an objective sense. Uh, it is being itself that weakens, but it is to being uh, that Vatimo's weak thinking keeps turning. Uh, it's some kind of a vicious circle, you might say. Two, uh, second example, Jean-Luc Nossi, uh, can be considered a critic of Heidegger. Mm, it's a quite harsh critic in his later work. Uh, think of the banality of Heidegger, it's quite hard. Uh, but as a lifelong careful reader of Heidegger, Nossi devoted his amazing energy to the Heideggerian enterprise, uh, as it Derrida, of deconstructing, abbau, uh, the history of metaphysics. In all Nossi's major philosophical texts, uh, finite thinking, sense of the world, being singular, plural, and many others, Nancy stresses the fact that the idea that, I quote, what there is, Dasein, yeah, uh, human existence, is diffracted being, end of quote. Now, what we call modern freedom is, not a quote, a singular and thus in essence plural arising, yeah, uh, which being as being is neither ground nor element nor reason but some truth, uh, which would amount to saying, under the circumstances, some freedom. And you recognize the post-structuralist move there. Uh, scattered principles, uh, groundless, even without reason, multiple, plural, uh, being means, being diffracted. And our being diffracted like this all the time constitutes our very essence, uh, designated by Nancy uh, as, quote, fractal essences. Or another quote, fractal sense. And that, beautiful thoughts, I, I think. It's our human condition, both as, as individuals and as communities, to be, another quote, diffracted in every sense, as, as purely as you can get now see. His, being, uh, his diffracted being is, as it were, uh, another case of mourning the loss of great master narratives, including what I called the uh, big, uh, not only of mourning, but also of more, uh, mournfully accepting. Uh, it's both. Now, there was this popular song at the time, so it's my time, maybe you know it, maybe not, uh, by Nick Lowe. I love the sound of breaking glass. Have you ever heard it? If you drop the glass from the equation, uh, you're left with the love of, for the sound of breaking uh, and of the uneasy silence that follows. And seemingly, I think, we do today uh, love the sound of breaking time and again, uh, if only to convince ourselves of, uh, ourselves of the reality of the silence following. Uh, both Nasi and Vatimo follow Heidegger in one case and or deconstruct him in the other by sticking firmly to the concept of being. Uh, this bias 
of being results in a strange obedience, I would say, uh, the continuous, uh, to, I would say, the continuous visualization of ontological structures, of their event, their adventures, their episodes. Uh, um, okay, my point. For Vatimo, uh, the weakness is weakness of the structure, of the world, of reality. For now, see all the fragments and splinters stem from breaking up the world, uh, its structure, its former essential realities. Um, but what we we are left with is weak being and being weak, uh, is diffracted being and being diffracted. Due to that unceasing obsession uh, for the being of being, uh, the idea uh, of nihilism uh, as a key structure of uh, modernity's noisiness, there's hardly any attention for, say, an acoustic alternative. I would like um, at least to try uh, to re interpret uh, Vatimo's weakness as a sound, uh, as faintness, and Nancy's multiple diffractions and uh, the fragmentation as the bouncing of echoes, uh, which could uh, also allow us, maybe, as the virtual part of my uh, speech, to reinterpret nihilism as the arrival of genuine silence, uh, unaffected, I mean, uh, by nephas, uh, by the silence of gods. Uh, but that remains to be seen um, or even heard. We live in this age of ever postponed godlessness, hmm, fatally exposed to the back background noises of ontology. That means, among other things, uh, that the name of our self-proclaimed freedoms uh, is constantly, constantly read back to us as the echo of divine silence. That's why, it sound, that's why that sounds like a sentence in, in, in the sense of an, a condemnation. Yeah, in Sartre, we're condemned to be free. Uh, or even as forced labor, I'll force you to be free, as in Rousseau. Uh, that's because of, of this undigested, uh, in my view, echo of this uh, mighty ontology. Okay, I'm coming to my third movement, even shorter, quieter because uh, more virtual. Let's now assume uh, I was able to suggest, uh, through my examples, Fatimo and uh, Nancy, how despite a century of intense efforts to either weaken or diffract being, uh, the ontological approach itself has remained roughly intact. Now, why is that important? First, because, so it seems, the ambitious projects of modernist and postmodernist philosophy to, I quote Heidegger or Derrida quoting Heidegger, uh, it's all there, uh, to destroy or deconstruct the history of Western ontology uh, of, or the metaphysics of presence, can hardly be called a success. Okay? That's the repetition of my statement. They somehow got stuck in the middle. Secondly, because, as Deleuze once claimed against the exist existentialist strategy, and I paraphrase, it won't help to remove God from the center at one particular moment just to install man in his place at the next. And that's his criticism of Sartre's uh, humanism. Similarly, uh, the resolve to get out of essentialism must backfire if, in the end, all you obtain are weak or fractal essences. It's still essences, it's still being. It's still ontology and more histories of ontologies all the way down. It seems like a case of post-traumatic stress disorder, or else the continuous relapse of an addict, or else some strange spiritual Stockholm syndrome, I don't know what imagery will do. Anyhow, we do keep on repeating out loud that we've been, or still are, tributary to this long history of ontotheology, uh, monotheism, monoculture, metaphysics, the ideals of universalism and unity, the ideas of supremacy coming with it, the con um, the, all the coloniality coming with it, uh, that we've got to get rid of it once and for all, 
free ourselves, cure ourselves of it, destroy that history of dependence, stop loving it or desiring it. We repeat the same message over and over again as if we needed to speak out constantly to convince ourselves as in daily prayer, recycling our impotence of finding our peace and thus our silence, instead reliving the same traumatizing history at every possible occasion. As we speak, a lot of amazing uh, collective work is being done on, quote, alternative ontologies uh, in decolonial studies. Also, a great deal of intellectual and social attention is being paid nowadays to the realization of alternative, say, non-binary or non-linear essences, uh, Nazis fractals. These repetitions, uh, the recurrent confrontation with past drama, and trauma and the prayer-like uh, ritualizations come with a certain recognizable violence. Uh, here I, I'll be provocative. In Nancy, uh, passages can be found uh, illustrating this strange outburst of violence and m several texts, but most clearly in a short text, The War of Monotonism against, quote Nancy, the will to domination of Western culture. Uh, it's a critique, and I, a criticism, uh, I can follow it, but it, it's in some passages in Nancy is so violent. Or uh, in Vatimo's weak thought, uh, to repeat the same examples, where an equally strange return to communism has happened, uh, the later Vatimo, uh, an almost Freudian return of communism, uh, the return of the repressed, you know, from Freud. In this case, the return of the suppressed uh, and of its liberator, communism. Uh, the lingering obsession uh, with ontology is, I believe, the meaningful factor here uh, and the cause of loud and violent outbursts of anger and frustration, uh, in this case philosophical anger and frustration, of a secretly backward-longing anguish, I presume. Uh, contemporary philosophy remains fully invested uh, in the unceasing, hectic ontologizing of the world. Uh, this, I believe, this is what uh, Derrida calls in um, How to Avoid um, Speaking, the, uh, quote, irreducible spacing of ontology. Uh, it's a nice thought, but I, I don't know if he does a, a lot of things with it. Um, that's for some other uh, discussion some other time. Now, how, you, know, you ask yourself, is that linked to the question of silence? Hmm? Yeah. Well... First of all, worüber man nicht schweigen kann, and lots of proverbs in the European and other languages saying it, the heart is full of, you, you, you cannot uh, silence. Um, it's a relentless racket, in my view, uh, of ontology's grave diggers, obsessed by the holes they fabricate. Um, some Sicilian contemporary of Heraclitus, um, Epicarmus, once said, and I quote, you're very clever at not speaking, we saw Derrida this morning, but totally incapable of keeping the silence. That's intriguing, and we should elaborate that too. Deafened as we are by the uninterrupted fuss about ontology, we have, I think, become unfit for the histories of silence. Take Heidegger, and my point of departure, and I'm almost concluding, so I'll come back to that in a circle, um, and the theme of the secret share of silence in his philosophy of being. Um, the, the core, the essence of what he calls time consciousness, uh, con constituting the meaning of being itself, uh, depends both on silence uh, that we saw, uh, I read you the passages, uh, and on ontology in an exclusive parallelism. It's the conclusion of Sign and Sight, and uh, the famous passages on the ecstatic human experience of time, uh, beautiful passages, uh, a totally ontological value. Hmm? We talked about this morning, gewesen sein, that's the past. Sein, da sein, that's the present. Uh, zukunftig sein, that's the future. And the most radical form of openness, as uh, Heidegger calls it, zu sein, in the zu, in zukunft, uh, future, what uh, Nancy later translated as être a, uh, being exposed to the same future, um, my point is, is, is purely and exclusively ontological. And does this, until this very day, 
uh, ontology, deconstructed or not, uh, remains the sole perspective on time, on history, on culture, in Western and, I believe, increasingly in globalized philosophy. Uh, all the fractured, weakened, provincialized, regionalized, singularized essences, uh, both individually and socially, and their corresponding ontologies, alternative or otherwise, uh, speak for this monopolization of human thought, and I believe for the fact that we are capable, we are incapable of finding our way out of this growing desert of philosophical ontological noise. Especially history, our human interpretation of things past is still being reduced to ontology, uh, to this compulsive loudness of the human ontological mind. And that's the reason why I just require the silencing of being. Uh, it's being, comma, silenced. The quieting of our ongoing ontological unrest uh, and the emergence of other softer, maybe even inaudible sounds becomes urgent. I call them echoes. That's the second part. And their non-ontological or para-ontological, I don't know how to call it, reception, I call echography. Like biography, echography. Learning the capacity of keeping, uh, guarding, protecting the silence. Uh, Sigan Epicarmus wrote, that's your sigestics, I believe. Uh, presupposes, in my opinion, the silencing of being. And this new skill, still to be acquired, of learning to listen to the past echoing differently, to hear other silences. For the past possesses nothing but the capacity of remaining silent, and I think thus of gaining out of it meaningful silences. Now, my echo is an ambivalent concept, as is all history, in fact. It refers first of all, to the well-known bouncing and dimming of a sound. Hmm? Echoes. Secondly, and more importantly, to the ancient Greek verb echo, uh, to have, to possess. For us here today, uh, the common sense is relevant because of, the, of its unfavorable meaning. Uh, since about all languages globally interpret echoes as dying sounds, you know, the image. Uh, must protest against such vulgar ontological interpretation. In my opinion, an echo signals the birth of silence, not the death of sound. And silence, wherever and whenever born, signals an unexpected appearance of meaning and sense. Then, second meaning, echo, to have, is the forgotten auxiliary verb, the suppressed servant, the censored, silenced, copula of ontology, uh, forgotten, suppressed, censored in ontology and by ontology. Uh, this verb, to have, denotes a primordial relation to the past. I have drunk, I have eaten, I have lost, I have lost both my parents, I have, I have, I have. Uh, things past. Uh, the preeminently silent region of time. Explaining this, and uh, the importance of to have huh? at length. Thinking all this true with you together would demand another lecture, maybe even a whole book. Maybe one day I'll write it. Uh, don't promise anything. Uh, the history of human having, we used to say human beings. We never say human having. Uh, the history of human having uh, of these echoes uh, as supplementary and not opposed to the history of human being, uh, of ontology, still largely has to be written. Uh, here I can only accompany you to the border of that region uh, of the silent past and the guardian, conservator, trustee of our better silences by showing some of the reasons why we need to go there and push back our essential no noises. So, in conclusion, uh, I'll suffice with a hint. Eco to have, uh, in Greek sense, this human practical linguistic tie to the past, non-ontological emanation of worldly events, should be regarded as some Spinozian idea, idea, as uh, Spinoza talks about uh, in eth his ethics, uh, as potentia mentis, uh, power of the mind, uh, axiomentis, uh, the 
action of the mind, voluntas mentis, uh, literally. And, and he says, and just one, one short quote, uh, sola mentis potestate esse tam loqui tam tacere. It's only in the power of the mind or to speak or to remain silent. So silence is an action to Spinoza, a power. It's uh, in, in possession of the spirit. Uh, that's an interesting thought. The silence of the past, uh, gone, it's dead, it's buried, it's hidden, uh, verborgen, is neither gewesen sein, as Heidegger says, nor tras, as Derrida says, of not only that, not even fragment or vestige. Uh, these are all ontological reductions. The past inevitable, inevitable silence is our potentia, uh, our potential position. Fortune, estate, uh, there for us to gain, uh, to acquire, in that sense, to have, uh, uh, if we're able to listen, uh, which means to really keep that silence, guard it. Uh, and just one example to illustrate it and to conclude, uh, is a classical sign, we, we spoke about this morning shortly, is a classical sign or even proof of madness. If one appropriates, uh, acquires and keeps uh, other strange identities, uh, this happened, as you know, at the end of 1888 with Nietzsche, uh, uh, when he started signing his letters with Dionysus, the Crucified, Napoleon, Caesar, Wagner, Buddha, uh, becoming himself in this breakdown uh, a ganz toller Mensch, uh, a topos. Yet, already in 1881, long before his descent into insanity, uh, before his being fractured and weakened, uh, Nietzsche wrote, and I quote, when it, it, it's in the Nachlass and the, the diaries, when I uh, speak, or think, uh, when I speak of Plato, Pascal, Spinoza, and Goethe, I know that their blood runs into mine, or runs in mine. There, he does talk about things he should part over in silence, and since he cannot honestly speak about that. It's pure madness to say things like that. But we know it isn't, you see. Uh, he continues, 1881, same fragment. Ich bin stolz, I am proud when I try to say the truth, speak the truth about them. Uh, again, Plato's, Pascal, Spinoza, Goethe. Uh, the family is good enough to me, and he means. That, it's just an example, examples are dangerous, I know. And that is a true and fundamental meaning of Spinoza's potentia mentis. And one of the fundamental meanings of having next to being. You of all people perfectly understand this, since you are philosophers as he was, as I am, or you are, else you are artists or historians of art historians, and it doesn't matter. Uh, um, we all do have this person we look up to and that taught us what it is to think or to to paint, whatever, there are examples. We all do have parents we don't have, you see. The silence of the past, and for instance, the silence of words in texts, as Plato called it in Phaedrus, Semus Pani Sigai, sacred silence, is there for us, in this case philosophers, to have, to make ours, uh, to make it, to make them, uh, related to us and us to them. Uh, past echoes in that vision are our true kinship. The past as being, diffraction, weakening, doesn't concern me as much as the past as acquisition, as power, as potentiality, as possession, but in the Spinozian sense of the word, um, as my very echoes. The best things I have in my life are things, parents, I don't literally genetically have. It's the echo and the echography uh, of the past silences that not only shows this to me, but maddens me, uh, but not in an, in, in an all but insane way. Uh, to have that silence, those echoes, is, I think, vitally important, uh, so much more than all the fuss on being, uh, to conclude my provocation. So yes, uh, let's silence being, let's have more madness, less weakness, uh, let's bring the ineffable silences of our human past back to life and uh, to our life. Let's be possessed, uh, between brackets, by silence. Yeah. Now, that was my conclusion. I have a, a fourth movement. It's three sentences. I wanted to make it a symphony, one way or the other. Echoes of Descartes. Cogito ergo tacio. 
echoes of Protagoras. Silence is the measure of all things. And I would like to, personally like to add to that, echo is the measure of all history. That aside. Echoes of a Marxist Wittgenstein. Die Philosophen haben vom Schweigen nur verschieden gesprochen. Es kommt darauf an, sie zu verändern. Thank you very much. <laughs>